So last week we talked about being pro-life in a more general way, but I'm going to reiterate some key things and go over some very specific issues in terms of medical and health related. And then and what we'll do is we'll start out with the key principles, because if you understand these, then when technologies come along, because in the medical field, things change fairly rapidly, and so something may come along and you want to, well, what do I do? Because the church hasn't maybe given an official ruling on it. Um, but if you follow these principles, most things are covered. Um, and if you have questions afterwards. So if we look at, first of all, which we've talked about over and over again in terms of human life is sacred because we are created in the image and likeness of God. And in your handout, you'll see that there are these principles and then what the catechism says about each of these issues. Um, it is sacred because from the beginning of all the creative action of God and remains forever in a special relationship with the Creator. And therefore, because we are sacred and we are created by God, then we belong to God, not even to ourselves. And that's important in terms of, no, you can't choose to commit suicide and kill yourself. Because if you belong to God and God created you, then why would you do that? Besides the fact that if you're in the image and likeness of God, then you would not want to kill yourself and destroy the image and likeness of God. We do not have a right to have children. Because if children are in the image and likeness of God, then how can we say we have a right to them? They belong to God, first and foremost. We are stewards. We are participating in God's creative nature. But we aren't the creator. And children are a gift. If you have a right to a child, then they're not really a gift, because you can't have a right to a gift. Human life begins at conception. That's a scientific fact. Every person began that way. We don't even have to talk about religion. That is a scientific fact. That's how we begin. Not at implantation. Conception, and I mentioned this last time, but w what people have done is they redefine words because they have an agenda. And so they have redefined conception as implantation. Implantation means that's when the fertilized egg implants in the uterus. Okay? But conception begins as soon as the sperm enters the egg, because that's how we all begin. That's the start of life. Any other point is arbitrary. And this issue which comes up and some people debate about and bring up, uh, and the reason I bring it up is it's a false argument. You can't even, don't bring up the issue of ensoulment. If people bring that up, it's a bogus argument because nobody knows. You can't know. Only God knows. And the theologians debate about it. If you don't know, then you have to assume conception in terms of that's the safest assumption. We don't know that. But any, but any other point is going to be arbitrary and you're not going to know. I mean, there's been teachings on this, but a lot of it was based upon not knowing scientific facts either. And theologians debate about this. And there's not, in the church, there's not a definitive statement. As far as I know, I mean, the latest... He, he, yes, he does. And he's the one that people always point to. And his point is that the cell commences, and, and he, by the way, he, and he validates the Aristotelian position that the soul is concomitant with life. And life be because of the right. And life begins at conception. Right. Yeah. 
But, but I would just say that there is, I don't think the church has come out with a dogma per se. That's, that defines this, but, but so it's still a bogus argument in the sense of we know this is a fact. And to look at this, is, you're, you know, Augustine supports this idea of it's a bogus argument to worry about that. You know, is it after so many multiplication of cells or, you know, because people bring in the whole issue of twins and, you know, and they're all bogus arguments. Even twins, that's how they began. Every human being begins that way. That's a scientific fact. So don't worry about insolment. You know what? Just that's when human beings begin. Life is sacred. That's what we have to deal with. Um... And, this is an important point, and you know, we had this discussion a little bit last week, is that human life is sacred no matter how that person came about. If you notice in the prayers, in terms of from conception, because I had this long discussion in my former parish, because they would say from natural conception. No. Even if somebody comes about artificially, it's still a sacred life. And that's why we have to say, even if somebody comes about through rape and incest, doesn't matter. It's still, it, that person is in the image and likeness of God. And that's why the church can't make an exception for that. The church understands that that's a horrible situation to be in. But if you believe a life begins at conception, then you can't say, oh, well, you can abort those that came about through rape and incest. It's still murder. It's still killing. You know, and you'll hear some people say murder versus abortion or killing and try to, you know, to soften. But what is it? It's premeditated murder. If you really, I mean, let's tell it what it is. But, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into people making, well, a woman making those decisions. That's why you have to be careful about judging the person, again, in terms of condemning a woman who makes that choice. Because there can be all kinds of, of factors beyond her control that are putting pressure. And there's always been, and the church would even say, as a culture, and sometimes we as a church, have created an environment that pushes women to make that choice. What about contraceptive as far as uh, the countries where they have a lot of rape going on in camps and things like that? Are they allowed? Would they be allowed to give that? Well, we, we'll, we could, we'll talk about the, that specific. That we're we're going to lay out the principles here in terms of that we'll judge that. Okay? Um, and because, again, because a human, every human being is sacred... One cannot hasten the death of a person for any reason, even to ease their suffering. Because the person belongs to God. And so if you are hastening their death, then you are participating in killing them. Even if your motive is good, it's still wrong. And that can be, you'll hear, and that's called euthanasia. When you do it as a mercy killing. And there's passive and active. Active means you're doing something to hasten their death. Passive is you're not, you're like taking away or not giving them water. Or nutrition. Or, gee, let's turn the temperature down. You know, I mean. What about palliative care? Yeah, we'll get to that. What about the euthanasia with animals? Do they? Oh, that. That, that, that no, 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 animals is fine. No problem. I know. I understand that. I'm not the person to talk to about that. But anyway, euthanasia for animals is perfectly all right. Okay, and you'll see several statements today. So. And now this, this was debated for a long time. And this is a principle now that the church has come out and ruled on definitively. 
is the provision of water and nutrition is always ordinary care. Even if you got to use a tube or whatever. So, now there could be circumstances where you don't provide that. But you have to justify that. Your assumption should always be that you always provide fluid, water, and nutrition to somebody. That doesn't mean you always have to go to extraordinary lengths to provide that. But, you know, at least if somebody is having a hard time, you have to continue to offer them water and food till they, they pass away. What is extraordinary? <sighs> Some people would say, yeah. Now, has the church said you have to put in a peg tube? No. But, why wouldn't you? Because it's not extraordinary care, really. It's not that hard to do. It's not a real big invasive procedure. So, and, and the point is, is if somebody's dying is different from, and where this usually gets into the problem is when we're talking about persistent coma or PVS patients. They're not dying. You know, people talk about prolonging death. How do you prolong death? If you really think about that. Now, you may keep them alive longer, so they suffer more, which is really what it's usually all about. So you, that's why you got to be careful about the way these words are used. And these use, words are picked because they appeal to our feelings and emotions. You know, and these can be very difficult decisions to make. I've had to deal with it with my father, who had cancer, and mother. And Ellen had to deal with it with her dad, who was basically made brain dead because of the care he got. So um, they're not easy decisions. But nobody said it would be easy. How do you get around DNR? Uh, yeah. Okay, what does that mean? Do not resuscitate. That's not the same thing as fluid and nutrition. But, but, you, but you have to, um, if, for you to issue that kind of an order, as a Catholic, you, what are your reasons? Don't want to put that burden on my family. What burden? Just going back. <laughs> but we don't know that's going to happen, do you? See? You don't know what's going to happen. So it's tricky. And, and I would say, again, these are the principles. When you look at a very give, a given circumstance, what's the probability of somebody surviving that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You, you know, in the hospital, just as an example, in the hospital, what's the probability of somebody who gets, who arrests and gets resuscitated, what's the probability of them really going home? Even if it happens while you're in the hospital. It's only about 10%. Because why? Because it's a reflection of how ill the person is. Now there are some benign arrhythmias that are they're not benign, but they can easily be treated. That can happen. Like you can have a heart attack that's a mild heart attack, but it just happens to be in a critical area. And you get a bad arrhythmia that can be reversed, okay? So, but it, more often than not, to have to be resuscitated is a reflection of how ill you are. And that's why people, you know, even in the hospital, don't do well. And you know, and outside the hospital, it's even worse. You can imagine. And, uh, yeah, we can get into all kinds of horror stories. I don't want to do that right now. Um, because I've had to deal with them. Uh, marriage, okay, so a DNR can be legitimate depending on the circumstances. <clears throat> but you gotta be really be careful and ask people why. The, the typical cop-out, I will tell you in the healthcare profession, 
is somebody says, oh, I just want da da da. And they basically are given a menu and pick, and nobody really talks with the person. And a classic example I can give you of that is this guy um, had uh, got pneumonia, and he had COPD, and um, he was hypoxic. So he had a living will, and he said, you know, hey, if this happens to me, I don't want to be intubated. And the doctor said, no, wait a minute. This is easily treated. This is a pneumonia. And we probably could treat this, and he'll go home. Oh, no, his wife said, no, no, he wanted this, da-da-da-da. Now, I'm certainly not accusing her of that, but, but you've got to remember, sometimes family members have not the best of motives also, okay? Um, so, you know, I don't think that was the case here, but I've seen that also. Um, so, the doctor said, no, we're, we're going to go ahead and do this. We're going to treat him and intubate him. And sure enough, he got better, got over his pneumonia. Now, it could have gone the other way. Now, yeah, I've got to be honest with you, but he got better, went home and tore up his living will. He said, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> Uh, so, go ahead. As a Catholic, if you're, say one of your big responsibilities is helping people fill out their DNR forms. That's, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Because how do you handle something like that? Well, they have a right to make their choice, but I think you have to be careful in terms of how much are you participating right. in what they're doing. And then that's one of the big issues in terms of conscience clauses. And now, it's tricky in the sense of, you know, abortion is clear cut. If you're helping somebody, you know, I, people would say, oh, well, if you're, you know, if you um, are opposed to it personally, da da da, then you at least have to refer them. And I say, no, I don't. Why, why do I have to refer them? Pregnancy is not a disease. So what am I referring them for? So that, that's, I don't have a duty to do that because I don't think it's in her best interest to do that. So I'm you know, making my choice on what I think is in her best interest. But she wants that. Well, you know, we sit there and say that about that. Somebody comes in and says, I want my arm cut off. Why? Well, I just want it cut off. Do we, do we say yes? Now, actually, you can go to Mexico and get that done, believe it or not, but <laughs> there, it's a syndrome, but anyway, it's horrible. But, I'm not trying to call you out, but <laughs> isn't, isn't there a fine line where, you know, if you're a medical professional, let's say, let's talk about the guy. Hey, you can go ahead and call me out, because you know where I did this for 25 years, and they knew exactly where I stood. <laughs> have to leave your your heart at the door. Like the guy who set boots like no nope. gotta set the letter. Nope. You know? Nope. You don't have to leave your values at the door and, and to think you do means you're a robot. You want robots taking care of you? I mean I was taught that as a medical student. Oh you leave your value that's crazy. You can't do that. Is what you have to do as a professional is you recognize what your values and biases are. And then you deal with that appropriately in caring for patients. Because everybody has them. Everybody has beliefs of some kind. Even an atheist has beliefs. Right? So. I was going to say, how about those OBGYN, capitalist OBGYN, Well, we'll talk about that. That's on the other side. We're, st we're trying to get through these basic principles that cover, that really covers all these. Now again, like I said before, is the principles are pretty um, straightforward, but the application of them can be difficult. Yeah. And that's why you got to pray and, you know, you, you can't make these decisions lightly in terms of life and death decisions. Um, okay. So in marriage, because a lot of this is related, that marriage is a lifelong relationship between a man and a woman that reflects the love and unity of the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So because of that, and, and in the cate catechism for man is creating the image and likeness of God who is himself love. 
Sexuality is a gift from God that is meant to be a gift from one spouse to the other. To witness the oneness of the triune God and gives man the ability to participate in God's creativity. The unitive and procreative aspects of marriage. Now, that's what the church says marriage is. Or one of the key aspects of marriage. That's, one of the, that's a key principle that applies to this. Sexuality is a gift only if it's shared according to God's plan. Any activity that replaces the normal sexual relationship between the spouses is not moral. That replaces. So in vitro fertilization is immoral, illicit. Okay? So when you look at these technologies, you can look. One, is there somebody else involved, as I said last week? If it's egg from somebody else, sperm from somebody else, of course it's immoral. You've involved another person in the marriage. We only believe in marriage between one man and one woman. Not two women and a man or two men and a woman and you know, so. And that's what it is, it amounts to. You're involving somebody else or some kind of technology. If you're separating that, the union, the sexual union, it's immoral. That's what the church is saying. As activities that assist the procreative nature of the sexual act may be moral. Okay? Just because it assists doesn't absolutely mean it is, but usually, usually that is the case. So, somebody has an infertility problem, takes infertility drugs, that's okay. Because what are you doing? You're just trying to help the physiology of the woman to work. All right, so that's okay. And there are things that men who are infertile can do also that are considered acceptable. All right. Marriage also reflects Christ's relationship with his church, the bride of Christ, in terms of the unity of Christ in the church. All right. So, if you look at those principles, let's see, did I cover everything on the board? Okay. So we're going to flip it over and we'll look at some of the specific issues that some of you have asked questions about. So let's, we can get back to some of those specific questions. Okay, contraception. Now, one of the things I, you have to be careful about is um, in this discussion and debate about contraceptions and whatnot, um, sometimes people will say things they don't really absolutely know. It's more of opinion than scientific fact, okay? Um, and I could tell you there is a site, I, I may have mentioned it before, if you go to, it's called um, uh, a Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And some are Catholic and some are not. And there's been a lot of debate um, on terms of contraception. And the debate goes somewhat like this. And we're talking about now, hormonal at this point. Okay. IUDs, clearly immoral because one of their modes of action, primary modes of action, is to prevent implantation. So that makes it a abortifacient or once there's implantation to cause the uh, ovum to die or get sloughed off. Okay? So that's cl they're clearly immoral. IUDs. Um, so the primary question comes in in terms of hormone. And there's basically two kinds. Combination and progesterone only. Um, if, and what I would do is challenge you, anybody who's involved with the use of contraception or prescribing them or whatever, 
I would challenge you to go just read the package insert and see what it says. And I promise you what it will say is one of the modes of action is to prevent implantation, which means it is the potential to be abortifacient. That's definitely the case with progesterone only. Um, now, the debate amongst these pro-life obstetricians and gynecologists is that, oh, it doesn't really do that. Um, and they'll give their reasons and the debate goes back and forth. Okay. I believe certainly that progesterone only are. That's my opinion, looking at the data. Combination, um, well, you know, the, the, the combination, their primary mode of action is to do what? Anybody know? Huh? Simulate pregnancy. Well, but it, what does it prevent? Ovulation. That's its primary mode of action. But guess what? Do women who take their birth controls faithfully get pregnant? Yes, they do. So it's not 100%, is it? So, and here, here is how you should approach this um, from a Catholic point of view. Now, I would tell you, you know, I, I, it, and to be fair, I think in terms of being balanced, is that any medication has a risk, right? You know, aspirin. There's not much doubt in my mind that if they tried to put aspirin on the market as an over-the-counter medication, it probably would not be approved for that because it's a very potent medication. It has all kinds of potential complications. Um, but it's been out there so long that, you know, trying to pull it back would be impossible. So um, every medication, if it's strong enough to help you, it has a potential risk. So hormonal, also, clearly, and what, are, what disease are we treating? Now, I have prescribed combination birth control pills for women who had menstrual problems to treat the menstrual problems, not as a contraception. And that can be legitimate, but you've got to be careful because all these medications Clearly, you know, there, this, it, it tends to be minimized, but I actually saw an autopsy on a young woman who died, and the pathologist was absolutely convinced that her only risk factor was birth control pills. Um, she was in her 20s, and she got what's called lateral vein thrombosis, where the clot being occurred in her brain, in the venous system, and she died. It's bad news if that happens. Because we clearly know that, that these medications, hormones, uh, can increase the, the risk of clotting. Um, it's much worse in women who smoke, etc. You know, and, and probably what it is is that there are a small group of women who are particularly susceptible to this. Um, so th in giving a medication, what is the risk and benefit? So if there is a potential to cause abortion, as a Catholic physician, why would you do that? Why would you take the risk of killing when you're not even treating a disease? <clears throat> so that's partly my challenge to you. Um, in terms of thinking about this, okay? Um, because the trouble is in terms of trying to decide who's ovulating and getting pregnant and having abortions because of these, almost impossible to study in terms of getting really good, what I would call hard scientific data. Because women have spontaneous abortions and miscarriages, and, and how do you know when that happens? You know, a lot of times women don't even know it. So it's just a very, very difficult thing to study. Um, some people have tried, but usually it's small numbers, and so 
We don't know. But why take the risk? Um, and when I became a Catholic, you know, in family medicine, is I said, hey, I'm, you know, I'm doing nothing but natural family planning. And, you know, I got a little bit of flack, but very little. The biggest difficulty when they make a mistake in terms of scheduling a patient <laughs> to get contraception, you know, and I'm like, sorry, I don't do that. Um, so uh, that, that was the biggest difficulty. But actually, people would say to me, they said, well, at least you're consistent. Because some of the, the Christians would argue, the Protestants would argue amongst themselves about, well, why are you doing that? Maybe that's potentially abortifacient, da 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 da. Oh, no, it's not. And they'd debate back and forth about that. So, And these are fairly solid Christians. So, um, All right, so any other specific questions? We could go on and talk a little bit more. Um, so, you know, in terms of DNR, DNR, actually we passed a thing in terms of our hospital, which was a took two years to get this through the ethics committee, a do not intubate. Because some people don't want to be intubated. But why? And that's why if you're involved in health care and people say that, you shouldn't just take that at face value. Because why are they afraid to be intubated? because they're afraid they're going to be on a respirator for the rest of their life. Rather than maybe be treated for a period of time and then get better. And the truth is, yeah, that's happened. You know, it's gone both ways. People want to be intubated and people say, no, no, we don't think you would benefit when you clearly would. You know, when you're talking about the probability of success of a treatment, you know, well, this treatment, maybe 50% of the time it's going to really benefit you in terms of controlling your blood pressure. Okay, that's one thing. But when you're talking about 10% of probability of being dead, or you know, being alive versus dead, well, is that an acceptable, you know, um, benefit? Because you'll hear the term futility. Stay away from it. It's, it's a plague. When people sit there and talk in terms of medical ethics, they want to use the term futility. Well, what does that mean? Is 1%, you know, chance of living, is that futile? 10%? 20? You know, especially when you're talking about life and death. Um, is the treatment, you know, what you want to focus on is, you should focus on is, is the treatment beneficial? That should be the primary focus. Is it going to help you? Is it going to help you live longer, less in pain, live better? You know, those are things you want to look at. But futility is too vague and depends, you know. Some Orthodox Jews would say you do 100%, you know, uh, in terms of treatment. If there's any chance at all that it might benefit me, that would be the mindset of some groups. So it could vary tremendously with depending on what you believe in your values. What about a comatose person already on the respirator and then there is a DNR? So you, yeah, you know, one, one of the things in terms of ethics is um, to take something away that is benefiting the patient. <laughs> is very difficult to justify because what have you done? What principle are you violating? You're hastening their death. If you never did it, now that can become passive euthanasia in a sense or a passive way of killing somebody. But you know, if somebody, can somebody justify not putting in a peg to? Maybe. But you can't really justify taking it out once it's in. Because the only reason to take it out would be to hasten somebody's death. What about um, pharmacists in like the morning after pill and stuff? I mean, if they're working there, still, I mean, yeah, let, let me tell you something. One of the things that's going on in this culture is people are the our culture and a lot of these people they're targeting Catholics in the Catholic Church 
Because who does that apply to these laws? Protestant hospitals don't care about the morning after pill. So when they pass these laws, which you've seen around various parts of the country, who's it targeting? Catholics. Now, this is a solution looking for a problem. Because there's no data that says that that treatment has ever done what it's supposed to do. And yet we're saying teenagers and anybody who wants to get it without a doctor's okay or whatever can go get it. The FDA says teenager. The political agenda trumps science in this case. Because if you go out and look in terms of a study that says, okay, we've studied this to say the morning after pill prevented X number of, of pregnancies. Good luck. If you find it, I'd like to see it. And you find this often, <clears throat> that political agendas trump science. You know, and we can look at this in the broader issue. These are the, these are the things that people talk about most commonly. But there's issues like, guess what, Let, you know, um, women, let's get mammograms. We need to start giving mammograms at age uh, 40. And then this data comes out and says, no, no, 50. The data's clear, 50. And the reason I emphasize that is this is politics. And people appealing to emotion. They're not appealing to some kind of standard. Because what we should say is, okay, if we're going to, for every life we save, here's how much money we should spend in terms of screening. And it ought to be applied to whatever. To prostate cancer, to colon cancer, to breast cancer. We ought to have the same standard. Well, if you go look at the data, to start screening women at the age of 40, the cost is huge. It's huge. And the benefit is, proportionately so, is much less. And, you know, people say, well, we're rationing. Of course we're rationing. You know, somebody comes in with a headache, we don't do an MRI scan on everybody who comes in with a headache. You talk about sending the costs out of sight. That's all we need to do is start doing that. So we, we make decisions based upon, you know, doctors make decisions based upon the best information they can, the better doctors do. Um, and try to make a reasonable assessment in terms of the use of medical technology and whatnot. Um, so screening costs, you know, to, to find a cancer. You know, for, so for every year of life you save, or um, people will say in terms of quality of life, you, you, what we need is develop some better standards and then not let emotion and politics trump the science. Um, but we see that happening. So when they came out and they were criticized, and I listened to this ex-surgeon general who's sitting there, and, oh, they're wrong. And I thought, what are you talking about? And she, so she's buying into the political agenda, you know, in terms of looking at this, rather than, okay, let's try to do this in some kind of coherent, systematic way. And, you know, medications, all this in terms of medical care. Um, you know, when you, when you go to see a physician, do you ever ask them what their values are? What their standards of practice are? I have a sheet that I'll show you that I, you know, if somebody wants it, what I would call the principles of practice for a Catholic physician. You can interview a physician before you decide to go to them, too. Yeah. Because if you, you sit there and you go to, we're talking about medical things in terms of life and death, and you don't ask what their values are? Think about that. That's crazy. You're trusting your life to somebody, and you don't even know whether they're an atheist or a pagan or a Wiccan or, you know, whatever. Which is going to affect how they practice. So, you know, so, to so some degree, you know, we are culpable in terms of even as patients 
Because we're all patients. Even doctors are patients. Because we don't sit there and hold the medical profession to the higher standard that it should be in some ways. Now, some of that is because, you know, you, you know form consent, for example. There are, th there are four key uh, ethical principles in terms of medical care. And, and there's a lot of ways you can look at medical ethics. You can look at virtues-based, and um, but I like the principles-based. And the virtues-based, the trouble with that is somebody may be a good person, but not very well educated. You know, so you need more than just virtues. But that's a good start. But you also want somebody who knows what they're doing. But what we typically talk about is, okay, justice is one of them. What are we talking about there? It's not just that, but it's, you know, we're talking about typically money in terms of, and resources, you know, who gets what, right? And so there's two ways to look at it. In terms of your doctor, what's called micro and macro. So what is this? <laughs> no, that's you and the doctor. That's where so sort of the rubber meets the road is how is how is the doctor treating you in this system? And a good doctor doesn't care about this. The good doctor cares about you. The system puts safeguards in place to deal with this macro in terms of the big picture resources because we have we do have limited resources but the other thing is, is when in this healthcare debate is when people talk about healthcare and justice and resources is people say oh we can't afford to spend more money in healthcare and i say well how much money do we spend on movies dvds cd's going to disney and on and on and on. How much money do we spend on makeup? How much money do we spend on pet food, pet care? But we don't have any more money to spend in health care for human beings? I think not. Now, we may not want to, but let's, you know, when people sit there and say we can't, that's a lie. We can, we just don't want to. So just remember that. Again, words are very important. So you got justice, um, you got beneficence, <coughs> what is that? Is it worth it? Huh? Is it worth it? <laughs> yeah, does it, th that the, whoever's taking care of you is doing it for your benefit. Okay, the other is non-maleficence or do no harm. Key principle. Now as I said, you know, when you're looking at medications and treatments, there's always some potential for harm. But you first of all, you look at it and say, okay, how am I going to harm this patient by doing this? And, and th that has to be minimized. This needs to be maximized and this needs to be minimized. That should be the goal. And then, of course, what's the biggie in our society? Autonomy. Now, these are the four that most people talk about. And the problem is that they seem to live out, leave out one other that should be a key part of this, and a key part of it as a Catholic, is duty and responsibility. You have to balance autonomy to duty and responsibility. Duty to your family. Duty to your community. <clears throat> but they don't ever usually talk about that a whole lot. <laughs> but autonomy runs everything in our culture. It's what I call the big A. Everything else is little case. <laughs> 
Because the big A, it's like people say, oh, well, you know, what do you want in terms of bringing in a menu? Okay, today I'll have an appendectomy. And, I mean, that's crazy, isn't it? But that's what people are trying to almost say. And that's not what we want. It's not good for us. There are, you know, people threw out, one of the things they threw out in terms of baby with the bathwater, and there were good reasons in terms of uh, um, paternalism. You know, what does a good parent want to do? Wants to take care of his kids. You know, and there, the trouble is it was very paternalistic. I mean, in fact, you go back and what was the duty of a patient? The patient's duty, people would talk about, to do what the doctor said. You know, and it was definitely out of whack in terms of involving the patient. But you'll hear things like in terms of informed consent. Well, you know what, if I take 10 physicians and sit them down and talk about certain diseases and treatment for them, diseases, I might get 10 different opinions. So how am I going to inform a patient to have an informed consent in a situation like that? Really difficult, isn't it? If the doctors can't even agree. <laughs> So these are the challenges in terms of, of, of health care. That's why you, you really ought to take seriously who is going to be your health care provider. And even more so now. Because, uh, you know, some kind of rationing in terms of really hardcore rationing is certainly on the horizon when you look at what's happening to health care. Because guess what, the, the just look at the demographics and why Medicare is going to go bust unless there's some dramatic change that occurs. Because baby boomers, my age, are going to be reaching their 60s and 70s and 80s and they're going to be living longer with more health problems, taking more medications, getting more tests done, because they are living longer, with more complicated diseases. Because, I mean, people, are, people clearly are living longer. I mean, I see these patients that, even in my lifetime, I've seen they probably wouldn't be alive. And they're living with just incredibly complex problems on 12 different medications and have at least three or four serious illnesses and living and, you know, that costs money. And this is this big peak that's occurring, going to occur over the next 20 years. So it's just a reality. I'm not trying to put a downer on everybody, but, uh, you know, this is just demographics. A lot of times you don't have to look at anything more complicated than that in terms of, gee, people are going to get old. Who's going to take care of them? You know what? We need to have a really robust immigration policy to help take care of the baby boomers. Because <laughs> we're not having kids, we're killing them. You know, one, just think of that. Since um, Roe v. Wade, in terms of how many millions of unborn children there are who would be adults now, productive citizens. We probably wouldn't have had the housing boom bust. So anybody else have any specific questions in terms of these the technologies? And what, the, what I gave you is a synopsis um, that came in terms of dealing with some very specific issues. For example, um, you know, infertility, like I said, you can assist the normal process. Um, you cannot do genetic ma manipulation because the risk is too great. If you start gen uh, manipulating genes in terms of embryos, now the possibility is still there that this could occur and be licit if, again, the benefit clearly outweighs the risk. And genetic manipulation to treat diseased genes not because I want somebody to be stronger, bigger, blue eyes, etc., etc. That would be Ill, uh, illicit. 
The church would never condone that. Cloning. Again, human beings that are not occurring in the way God intended. Now, if you do, which it hasn't happened, if you did create a human being that way, still a sacred life because you know I, I think I may have said this in this group is this priest said uh, people are creating life da 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 and afterwards I went up to him and said you're wrong they are not creating life they're manipulating the life that's already there cloning is manipulating what the life that's already there nobody has created a whole human being instead of genes and genetics de novo you know in the lab okay from scratch um, euthanasia is now pain care that is an important issue if you treat somebody can you treat their pain even though it may hasten their death yes if that's not your intention and the intention is to treat the pain and the, the example would be if somebody is on morphine for example and you're giving them IV morphine and you're giving them uh, six milligrams and uh, they don't get any benefit, okay? So now you give eight or ten. Okay, that would be reasonable. But if they weren't getting, you know, a pain relief with six and you went to 20 IV, yeah, that would be very, I would have to question your motives. Because you should go, you would go up incrementally. If you go to a huge jump, then what's your motive? Because what pain medications do is they suppress respirations, and that's how they typically will kill somebody. Is they'll stop breathing. I actually participated in a review of a case in the hospital where a woman in her 40s. That's probably what killed her was an overdose of narcotics because it did two things. One of the things is too much narcotics can cause pulmonary edema, which impairs your ability to oxygenate, obviously, and breathe, but it impairs your normal response to the hypoxia, the low oxygenation. And so we thought she died of a, uh, probably a pulmonary embolus because she was young. She'd had surgery and she was supposed to go home that day and Nurses came back and found her dead, and the autopsy showed pulmonary edema. And the only thing that put her at risk for that was the medications. We again, it's it's incremental, not huge jumps. You know, and it, and it depends on the medication. You know, I mean, some things you can double. There are some things, especially if it's oral, you can double and it's not that big a deal. But when you start giving IVs, doubling and tripling uh, tends to be a bigger deal. Again, depending on the patient. So, it can be difficult. Because, you know, the standard criticisms of, in the, of the healthcare profession in the past has been that we didn't give pain medication often enough and we didn't give enough of it at the time and just creates this whole cycle of people begging in a, a drug seeking behavior while they're in the hospital which is bad um, because you know withdrawal from narcotics will make you wish you were dead and feel like you wish you were dead but it won't kill you Whereas there, there are some, actually there are some medications if you withdraw from, they, they will actually kill you. You'll die uh, if you stop them suddenly. So it usually has to do with barbiturates because people get seizures and so there are certain drugs like that. But Does anybody else have any specific questions, Zachary? Is your question answered yet? <laughs> I, you know, I don't think there's a simple answer in terms of do not intubate. Any, anything that would, you know, that you're making a decision about that results in death needs to be taken seriously. But the church hasn't said you have to get on a respirator. Um, but then once you're on a respirator, 
turning it off. And that's part of the whole thing getting on a respirator. And why patients don't want it. Did you? What is, I mean, it's a dumb question, but what are some extraordinary measures for keeping people alive that, that maybe you should avoid? Perhaps? What are extraordinary measures? Well, I think, you know, is, is there going to be any realistic benefit in terms of, you know, and the tricky thing comes like somebody's got cancer, you know, and um, say they've got, you know, obstruction of their bowel, do you operate, you know, to relieve that bowel obstruction? So it'd be like maybe yet another operation that seems like it's just over the top. But it's a horrible way to die right. with a bowel obstruction. So I mean, those are those are the kinds of decisions that are you know in the in the trenches that are they're not easy to make. No, and you don't always have a lot of time. Yeah, sometimes you don't. And you That's right. Under a lot of pressure. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, like what if you got a, somebody who's a Seventh Day Adventist or you know, and a child and needs a blood transfusion and they don't believe in you know. Although they've modified their theology some, but anyway, and uh, and they show up in the emergency room and the kid needs a blood transfusion. First of all, blood transfusion you want to avoid it if if at all possible. If you could treat somebody in any other way, because there are bad things that happen to you through blood transfusions, you know, uh, HIV, hepatitis, etc. So if you can avoid it, you you know it's not something you want to take lightly. We took it way too lightly back when I was a medical student. Um, but at the same time, it's maybe the only thing that's going to save somebody's life. So what do you do? Treat them. You know, because nobody's ever lost a lawsuit in terms of being, you know, sued by a Seventh-day Adventist because they treated some kid who was going to die if they didn't do something. I always taught taught medical students, they'd say, worry about, you know, they're always talking about being sued and worrying about sued. I said, you know what, you could be sued for doing the, the best care possible. If somebody gets mad or whatever, you could still be sued. You know, so it, although it's getting harder, depending, because as Ellen's father's situation, we, we couldn't get a lawyer. Even the lawyer looked at it and he said, before they changed the tort reform, in South Carolina, he would have taken the case, but they made it so hard now that he wouldn't take the case. So it depends on state by state. It's, it varies a lot. But if you do the right thing, you want to go to court saying, I did what I thought was in the best interest of the patient. And anybody who's involved in health care, you know, if that's what your motive is, you know, that's what you should go with. Don't worry about it. Because if you worry about being sued and everything you do, you'll go nuts. He'll be a horrible, probably, practitioner. I've seen a few like that. You know, ordering tests like crazy, and, which is not just. It's making him feel better, but it isn't better for the patients or the insurance company. You know, people talk about that a lot. Yeah, you know, I don't know how big an issue that really is. You know, you hear it in the media a lot. Personally, I didn't see it amongst my colleagues a whole lot. There'd be one or two who were like that. Most of them were pretty reasonable, but you know, I have to be honest with you. I mean, I had a really good group of physicians that I was working with, so because we were, you know, teaching students and residents all the time, so it kind of kept you on your toes and challenged you, and we challenged each other, and um, but the system doesn't necessarily reward great care. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody have anything they want to share about medical dilemmas they've faced? You know, the probably true pro-life obstetrician, or Catholic obstetrician gynecologist uh, is an endangered species, but there seems to be some resurgence right now. Um, there's a Catholic Medical Association which is actually growing. I was involved many years ago and it was like didn't look like I was going anywhere, but <clears throat> there were things at that time we were working on and changes being made, and, and it's come along. It's growing. A lot of people, I have to tell you, at the last meeting I was at, just meeting a lot of guys who've converted or reverted in terms of just really coming back to the church strong and following the church's teachings, and um, so it's pretty hopeful. Where um, 
I told the physician that I am. So he told me that I was dictating, dictating him or, or telling yeah. him what to do. Uh -huh. And so I just told him that, uh, sir, you know, we don't even know if the, he said I already ordered for the family to do these. And I said, uh, the patient when I interviewed, don't even, he's not even sure whether she's taking it or not. She's not even sure about her medication. So that's the reason why I was, I was uh, uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I, would, I would stay late for him to do the procedure. If, you know, he just, uh, I just draw the blood, set it down, and then, you know. But he was sad with me. He was the one Hell yeah. So, Doctors don't have egos. And so, uh, <laughs> the higher ups, you know, and, and, uh, and in fact, the, the head nurse was mad with me why, you know, why I would not uh, go along with it. And, uh, and so, um, they brought it up and I said, okay, well, how would you handle it? And so they told me how to handle it. That go ahead and do it, but they charge that that the, the MD wants to go ahead to do it. So maybe kill the patient, but protect yourself. Yeah, cover my butt. <laughs> <laughs> what, what would that do? You know, his mother, he would not do that, you know. Because an INR, if the person is, high, you know, had an INR that was like six or seven, and you did this procedure, yeah. then they could have bleeding in the brain and who knows what. So. So it could potentially kill the patient. Um, if that's that's right. Could knock it loose and yeah. So th those are difficult things, you know. But you know, part of this is the reality is that at some point you have to choose to do the right thing and pay the cost. I, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I, I, I stopped right there and then left. And then after that, he came and apologized. He didn't really look at me, but he just said, you know, I'll, I'll apologize. Did he follow your recommendation? I'm sorry? Did he follow your recommendation? He, 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 uh, he did not do the procedure. He didn't at all. He did not. Although somebody said that he would do it for him, he still did not do it. So that was it. And then the person that said he would do it for him was mad with me, and then went to the higher ups. <laughs> but and you could have saved her life by doing that. that. That's right. I said, you know, that still is just covering me, but then, you know, it would kill the patient. And then yeah, the, you know, the sad. The sad thing is, is a lot of the procedures in the hospitals, although well, there are some procedures that are meant to protect patients, some of them are meant to protect the institution. I mean, that's just a sad fact. Rather than really, you ever, you ever hear the, this is one of my favorites, is um, um, you have to sign out AMA. Somebody's in the emergency room and then they, and the doctors in the emergency room will say, oh, if you're going to leave, you have to sign out against medical advice. Where is that in law? What am I, a prisoner? What do you mean I have to sign out AMA? That's ridiculous. So, you know, I would tell residents, don't, don't pull that on patients. <laughs> they don't have to sign out AMA. If they want to leave, they can leave. You know, you just document, talk. I mean, is what it, it creates is an adversarial position, and it's more about protecting the institution and the doctor than really the patient, rather than talking to the patient. Because then, then the patient's going to get their hackles up and everything, and um, sometimes people change their mind if you talk to them reasonably, and you know. So, anyway, anybody else have any medical issues or other ethics issues? Oh, I'm not sure for us anything to do with what we're talking about, <laughs> but I just wanted to ask. Um, we're thinking about um, storing the baby's cord blood. For yeah, that's fine. Yeah, as long as it's not used for cloning. <laughs>
But yeah, a lot of people are doing that because, you know, down the road it may be possible that they might be able to take cord blood and, you know, cells and uh, which I, you know, it's in the document there, but in terms of stem cells, adult stem cells, yes. Embryonic stem cells, no, unless they come from cord blood. You know, some, or um, a fetus who's died from natural causes or something, um, you know, using that tissue is okay. The one thing that I did want to say to parents in terms of using embryonic stem cells and whatnot is, which by the way, you see this debate all the time, and the debate is, well, embryonic stem cells in terms of research and potential and da-da-da, and gee, how come we've had all kinds of success with adult stem, stem cells, and we haven't had any really with embryonic stem cells? So what, what's the push? Why is it such a mad dash and push to fund and do things with embryonic stem cells when the success has come in adult? Because there's agenda, a political agenda. I promise you that's the case. Otherwise, because it's not rational. It does not make sense scientifically. It's to support the whole idea, oh, abortion's okay. Embryos, do whatever we want with them, etc. That's the agenda, whether it's conscious or unconscious. Because otherwise, it doesn't make any logical sense when you think about it. So anyway, but you find that some of your immunizations have used embryonic stem cells and tissues from aborted fetuses okay so is it licit for you as a parent to give your child those immunizations <coughs> and you know that's something people have worried about and debated about and the church has said yes because you're very remote from that you're not really supporting it, but at the same time, you have a duty and responsibility to speak out against that. The use of aborted fetuses for research, etc. Okay? So you can licitly use those immunizations that have come about that way. And parents. You, you older folks don't know, unless you got grandkids, I mean, the number of shots that kids are getting these days is like, oh, it's unbelievable. And yet with pets, they're telling us to do fewer of them. Well, which is a good thing, I mean, but. Yeah, I mean, I mean the immunizations, they're clearly, uh, some, not all necessarily, some are clearly beneficial. I mean, there, there's just no doubt that some have been, you know, measles, you know, measles rabbit, I mean, it was, it's pretty dead, especially if kids are malnourished or something, but it, it causes a lot of problems. One of the things I think we're looking at over the whole, uh, probably all the is not over it, uh, is going to be probably human farming for fetuses on this political agenda because in order to meet the demand uh, as opposed to using adult specifically our own internal stem cells which we all have uh, and I think that's uh, and I think that is the ultimate uh, agenda traffic. yeah maybe yeah it may be um, although with st adult stem cells, you'd think you'd accomplish that, be able to accomplish that too. And, you know, and the, the reason for you having cord blood is maybe, you know, down the road they'll be able to grow a kidney, you know, or a heart, or you know, skin or something. Um, you know, that, those are possibilities. Oh, and the, the other thing on the that particular issue is the whole adoption of embryos that have been abandoned. And the church has said no. That the, the goal of people who want to do that is admirable. You know, it's like adopting children, in a sense. But is, the church is basically saying no, it's, it's, too, it's a horrible evil that all these embryos are out there. 
um, but it's too close in terms of uh, uh, participation in the evil for people to adopt and in a way it perpetuates it because then it's like people say oh well, what's the big deal if we create these embryos and store them is th there's these people over here who will adopt them you see so what's the church's opinion on the people that uh, create life to benefit another life as far as I mean having a child to save another child that would be wrong because then the child becomes an object. It's treating that child. Now, they, you know, they, they may love the child and everything, but the motivation is a bad motivation. Because it's really treating the child as an object rather than for the child itself. So. No, oh, I agree about that. Yeah. And, um, well, um, some mothers are probably going to shoot me, you know, because uh, the Girl Scouts now, I mean, are, are uh, which they probably don't know this, are supporting Planned Parenthood. And a lot of people... Well, here's what I'd say about that. Is I would say, suggest to you that you do your own research on Girl Scouts. Now, I, I would not support Girl Scouts. I will not buy Girl Scout cookies. But, um, <laughs> because if you look at the leaders and people involved in the Girl Scouts, now I've looked at their website, I investigated this extensively, um, and it's tough to put your finger on it. But then these things happen um, that if you go back and look at the people who are leaders, that's where the sort of smoking gun is in terms of um, issues that I have in terms of, especially in sexuality and whatnot. And there is an alternative that's clearly Christian. The, what is it, Pioneer Girls? There, there's an alternative to Girl Scouts that's clearly Christian in its orientation that reason I'm a big supporter of Boy Scouts. Anybody who's willing to stand up and say, okay, we're not going to change our agenda for There's gays. And... Uh, huh? <laughs> they need cookies. <laughs> That's what they need. We need Boy Scout cookies. <laughs> I'm surprised then that St. Joseph's yeah. has a Girl Scout. Well, the, the, you know, the, the local group may be perfectly fine, but the, the problem, see, the problem with any group is what's called scandal. <coughs> In terms of you, you may be doing things perfectly correctly and righteously and according to the church's teaching, but if you're affiliated with a group that's not, um, then that lends to scandal. And, you know, why do that? But, you know, I, it, it was not easy to find a lot of information on the Girl Scouts, uh, you know, so um, that agenda. What, what, let, let's say that we have discussed this in staff meetings. <laughs> This whole thing about Girl Scouts. It's been discussed. Okay, um, I think AWT and I think Tony uh, has, has, has read that uh, the Girl it was about Scouts the were invited oh. in the, the UN and then no parents were allowed. And, and then we talked about, uh, you know, that the abortion was, you know, sex yeah. is okay and, and they promote, they promoted it. Yeah. And then the, the parents were not even there. Any other questions? If you, you know, if anybody comes up with any, you know, if you have medical issues and if you work in the healthcare profession and you've got questions or stuff, you know, I'll be glad to help anytime I can because I've taught it for 20 something years and was on ethics committee and um, so.
I, I just um, heard of a case from uh, Suzanne's husband about something at a hospital. It made me very wonder. It could use some ethics committee could use some beefing up. It sounds like. <laughs> So, you know, and that's one of the things you got to remember. These institutions are secular institutions. And if you think they're going by Christian rules, you got another thing coming. You know? Sad thing is some of these so-called... Most of the Catholic hospitals are getting their act together, but just because it says Catholic doesn't mean it's faithful either. So be careful. You know, what are the the rules. That's why, you know, knowing who your doctor is is important. They can look for, and having family with you. You know, I tell this to the seniors, and I said, look, if you get, put somebody in the hospital who's sick, you always want to have a family member with you. You know, if you're very alert and everything, okay, but if you're really sick, man, you do not want to be left alone in the hospital. Not these days. And, and this is not a reflection on nurses, but nurses are strapped. I mean, nurses have to care for more patients than they did when I started. The ratios are just way different. And besides the fact that they have more patients, they have much more paperwork to do. And paperwork does not equate to patient care. <laughs> I mean, this is even true of doctors. We have more paperwork and stuff we do. It doesn't equate to patient care. You have the best documentation in the world and still have horrible care, right? <laughs> How many here are in the healthcare profession? And if it's not documented, you need to do it. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. It really and, and you know, it, yeah, it, it's true in the sense of nobody knows you did it until if it isn't documented. But just because it's documented doesn't mean it was done either. <laughs> our society is I think the way that we got to the point where we, there's so much documentation that's done now is because there were so many lawsuits and so much money and paranoia created that everybody's now in a yeah. practicing medical med uh, uh, legal medicine yeah lawyer what are you going to say about that <laughs> I mean, you know I, I was just going to yeah. say people blame lawyers for this. Well, they took that case before a jury, and the jury gave them that oh, amount yeah. of money. It was 12 people that decided that. Or, or yeah, many. although sometimes it's just the judge, but yeah. I don't yeah. need that kind of law, though. Yeah, yeah. I don't get paid anything. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, see, my, you know, how come doc lawyers uh, are allowed to be legislators? Isn't that a conflict of interest? No. <laughs> <laughs> you, mean, you mean the lawyers who make the law, who then benefit by the making of the law? That's not a conflict? Lawyers are the only profession in the country though, that regulate themselves completely. You know, our highest authority is other lawyers. Uh, no other person really say that. I yeah. Tend to like that. Yeah, I guess doctors tend to regulate themselves for the most part, too. There are <laughs> other regulations, but it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, just as an interesting sidelight is in terms of the ethics in an organization is ask yourself who decided what those ethics were. Ask the AMA. The AMA has this code of ethics. Who decided what those ethics are? Did you get the vote? Did they ask for your input? That doesn't mean they're bad, but at the same time is, gee, how about the people who are affected? Shouldn't they have some input into that ethic? If it's just the do lawyer, doctors deciding what's ethical amongst themselves, and not the people who are affected by their practice and behavior, it's suspicious. So I think you ought to look at it with a jaundiced eye. <laughs> and be suspicious to some degree. I think a certain healthy skepticism is appropriate in dealing with physicians and the health care system. Be smart. And again, what's the values of the provider you have? And you know, right now, most of you are probably fairly healthy and so you don't think it's a big deal. 
But get, what's going to happen when you get really sick and it becomes life and death decisions? So, do, yeah, interview your doctor. Ask them what their values are. You ought to have a check sheet, you know, in terms of what would you do in these circumstances, da 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 da. Where's the closest Catholic hospital to me? Is there one in Atlanta? Yeah, I don't know how Catholic they are, to be honest, though. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, they're the Saints Joseph, like in, in Augusta, was fairly Catholic, but. They're closed down, so. Yep. And you saw the Catholic Health Association supported the health care legislation in spite of what the bishop said, so. I, their stamp of approval ought to be looked at a little jaundiced eye, so. But Catholic hospitals, is, as an institution, I think, are not long for this country. The way. The way legislation is going and targeting of Catholic institutions and these laws in terms of trying to practice according to your conscience and whatnot is um, you know I, th I think they're not long for unless there's a major turnaround they're going to end up closing down because to me if you can't do <laughs> practice as the church says then and you're practicing like the other hospitals then why bother to be in business as a Catholic institution I mean, that's crazy. There's plenty of hospitals out there. And now that everybody, you know, one of the things, you know, that was true of Catholic institutions, they did tend to take care of the uninsured more so, percentage-wise. But now everybody's insured, so.